first thing you have to understand about me is that I love life. I love living, and I very much would like to share that with our children and our grandchildren. So we don't know what their world will look like, but we do know a couple of things. We'll know that in order to survive, they need just three basic things. They'll need air, water, and food. So with this basic passion for wanting to share life with future generations and just that basic knowledge, I've led a career path as a hydrologist, a climatologist, and as an agronomist. And I've primarily been focusing on H2O, so you can kind of sum up all that by just saying I'm a water geek. And, but from a water geek's perspective, there's, it's pretty obvious that there are two major obstacles getting in the way of our simple ability to share life with future generations. The first obstacle is that we have an overconsumption of our natural resources. It's basic supply and demand graph. So in this example here, basically all you need to know is that this blue line is the supply. It's the supply of the Colorado River, which supplies water for 30 million people. The red line is the demand. That's how much we consume. Now, obviously, the point of contention is here where those two meet, lines meet. And we've been able to stomach this trajectory with the knowledge that, or with the attitude that well, future generations will have increased technology, they'll find new sources. But when I add the x-axis to this graph, you'll see that this point has already happened. So the time to do something about it is now. And the people who are going to do it are we. <laughs> so the second major obstacle, even if we balance the supply and demand, is that our supply of food and water is not adaptable to a changing climate. So in addition to working as a climatologist and agronomist and a hydrologist, I also work as a raft guideologist. <laughs> This photo is from the Grand Canyon. In the Grand Canyon, as you travel down the river, you pass through the layers, the canyon walls. And each layer represents a dramatic different landscape and representation of a different climate throughout the history of the planet. So I want to be very clear about this second obstacle. It's not necessarily the fact that the climate is changing. It's that our supply of food and water will not adapt to any changes. One example of that is the lack of diversity in our food supply. So of the thousands of varieties of edible plants, we grow four for almost 95% of our crop production. Each one of those having a pretty fragile climate window with which they operate. A slightly more extreme example of this was from my ancestors who relied on one primary crop. And 150 years ago, when there was a blight on the potatoes in Ireland, two million people died and another two million emigrated. Many of those to the United States, and that's why I'm here today. So there you have it, our two major obstacles, overconsumption of natural resources and a lack of an adaptable supply. So here's a map of the Colorado River and its watershed. And I, one of the companies I work for in the Grand Canyon um, and on rivers is a school by the name of National Outdoor Leadership School. And we teach, we go on multi-day river expeditions and we teach environmental science and a leadership curriculum. And my favorite class that I teach is I draw this map, that's me, I draw this map with a paddle in the beach. And then I take a rescue rope and I draw out the river. And then I take a bucket and I start at the top of the river and I scoop out the water and I show how much water we're using for agriculture, how much for industry, how much for municipalities. And then of course I get to the Sea of Cortez and the bucket's empty because we've consumed the river entirely. And it's always pained me that I'm presenting these problems and I wasn't able to just hand them a blueprint with how to solve them. So what I would do instead was I would sit them down and I would just say, listen, you are the future leaders. It's up to you to have game-changing ideas to get around these obstacles, that, around the trajectory that we put you on. Because even though I had dedicated my career to addressing these issues, I was doing things like measuring evapotranspiration for an agricultural field to drive irrigation efficiencies for a field of alfalfa that shouldn't be grown in the middle of the desert in the first place. 
Then one day, <laughs> I'm listening to a podcast, riding my bus on the way to work, and actually some of this, this podcast, some of you may have heard about it, it's called a TED Talk. <laughs> some of you have heard of it, that's good. And this TED Talk was a Dutch professor by the name of uh, Marcel Dika, and he presented an idea about eating insects. And he showed how insects are eaten all over the world, mostly just not in Western Europe and the United States. And he laid out all the environmental benefits and the health benefits and the economic benefits. And I thought, I remember sitting up, actually, very specifically in that bus, and my eyes opening and being like, this could be an idea worth spreading. <laughs> so I remember I stopped on my way home from work that very day. I stopped in the library, and I got every book on insects and insect consumption that I could, and I just read everything I could. And basically, this is some of the information that I found. So if you take 10 pounds of feed, which is primarily what that pie chart was, because that's what we're growing here, and you give that to a cow, that cow will grow one pound. If you give that same 10 pounds of feed to crickets, they'll grow about six pounds. So strikingly more efficient at converting plant matter into an edible protein. Now, as a water geek, this one's super exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so crickets are more than 10 times more efficient at using water and turning it into protein and even more efficient than livestock substitutes like corn, soy, and rice. Land, again, 10 times more efficient than cattle. You can actually grow these things in bins and you can stack them vertically. So per unit area, you get a lot more protein out of it. You can grow them in urban areas. So why, <laughs> why aren't we? You actually, <laughs> what? You actually don't even have to be a, an environmental altruist to understand it. So it gets even better. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Crickets are like little hopping superfoods. <laughs> They're a complete protein. They're high in calcium, iron, vitamin B12. And so the one reason why we don't eat insects, there's only one, and I'll tell you the reason why we don't eat insects without any words. You ready? This is why we don't eat insects. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's the only reason why we don't eat insects, because some people make a funny looking face. <laughs> that's nothing. With all the reasons why we should, and that's the only reason why we don't. I listened to that podcast three years ago. So one year after that, two years ago, knowing all this, with the help of lots of friends and family, we started a company with the sole mission of introducing insects into Western diets as a healthy and sustainable form of protein. So because we were a bunch of raft guys and outdoor enthusiasts, we kind of ripped a page out of the book from every mountain biker and ski guy and rafter that says, if you have an obstacle in front of you, in our case, the funny face, if you focus on it and, and that's where you're looking, you're going to hit it. You're going to do an endo and you're going to lose your teeth. But if you, if you see that obstacle, you immediately divert your energy and your focus around it. And so that's kind of what we did. So let's look at our obstacle, the funny face, a little closer. So there's a man by the name of Jeff Lockwood who has a theory that says, human beings have a heightened awareness associated with insects that's biologically programmed in our DNA because through tens of thousands of years as foragers, we had to quickly identify if an insect was a potential food source that we had to grab quickly or it would skitter away, or if it was something that was harmless, like a black widow or a scorpion, and, and we were the ones that had to skitter away. So I like to call it similar like, to the fight or flight mechanism. I like to call this the meal or squeal mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> but because of when European style of agriculture came over to North America, it all but wiped out the meal aspect of it, and so the decision-making process is out, and we're left with this funny face. So, okay, funny face is our obstacle. How do we jump over it? <laughs> well, there, there wasn't any model to follow for us. Um, there was no insect-based product, so what we did is we looked at other industries that had a similar psychological barrier or hurdle that they had to get over. And the closest parallel that we could draw was sushi. So sushi, the more we learned about it, was very strategically introduced. And so the, the stepping stone, the baby step for us, was the California roll seen here. And one of the most brilliant things that they did was that they took the rice 
and they put it on the outside of the nori. So we didn't have to visually see that foreign looking seaweed. So we learned from that and we said, okay, let's take the visual component away from insects. So how we do that, these are some photos from our kitchen. We take a big bowl of crickets and we rinse them just like you would a, a bowl of shrimp, another edible arthropod. <laughs> we then take those and we spread them out on baking sheets. We throw those baking sheets in some convection ovens. We take them out and we put them through a stone mill. We come up with a very fine powder. Put our creative caps on to come up with a name for this and we called it cricket flour. <laughs> Maybe not creative, but pretty descriptive. We then take that cr uh, cricket flour and we throw it in a bowl with a bunch of healthy, organic, all natural ingredients, nuts, and throw a little kitchen voodoo in there, mix it around, and what we come up with, voila! <laughs> we make energy bars. So very familiar, just looks like any other energy bar. However, we're hoping it's a little more than that. As the introduction of insects is a healthy, and sustainable form of protein that will drive a whole new sustainable form of agriculture. So I am under no grand illusions that insects are gonna cure all of our food security issues because the fact is there's no single solution. It's going to take a very multifaceted approach. For example, should we be growing a wider diversity of plant species like quinoa, which grows at high altitude arid environments? Yeah, definitely. And what about increasing the amount of edible gardens in our front yards, open spaces, and rooftops? Great idea. And what about removing a bunch of dams in the Pacific Northwest to make room for a sustainable form of protein that just swims upstream every year? Brilliant! <laughs> the ideas are literally endless. So as we look forward into the future, with an infamous two-degree rise in global temperatures, do we have to view it necessarily as catastrophic? Well, maybe to an overconsumptive monoculture style of agriculture that we probably shouldn't be relying on for our survival in the first place. And if it's associated with rising sea levels, maybe to some political boundaries and coastal infrastructure. But people will move. And the hardships associated with these human migrations, some of which we've even heard here today, if you look at them with a wide enough view, you'll see that human migration is woven into the fabric of what it means to be a human being on this planet. And I'm well aware that a two degree rise in temperatures hasn't been seen on this planet for 10,000 years. Wow! What an exciting time to be alive. <laughs> Those of us generations alive today have the opportunity and the honor to redesign the infrastructure of our civilizations that have been in place for thousands of years. So if you, like me, would like to share a livable future with future generations, I will tell you the same thing that I told my students on the bank of the river. It's up to you to come up with these game-changing ideas. It's up to you to figure out a way around and over and under these obstacles ahead of us. And even more important is to support the ideas of your neighbors that come up with these ideas, these revolutionary ideas, even if it means you suffer the burden and the hardship of changing your daily habits. And even, even if it means that a few people around you make a funny looking face at you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>